Hello, everyone. I'm John Tain, Head of Research at Asia Art Archive. It's my honor to welcome you. Sorry, I'm going to position my phone a little where it should be. So that you can see. Uh, to welcome you to Instruments of Instruction, the first panel in the Art Schools of Asia Symposium. Starting in, starting in the fall of 2021, at a moment when travel was out of reach for most of us, we at AAA have had, have had the enormous privilege of convening monthly with the remarkable 18 emerging scholars who formed the Art Schools of Asia cohort. The seminars with them took us on a journey across time and geography. From Shantiniketan, founded by Rabindranath Tagore in the early 20th century as a school for the arts with both local and international aspirations, to China and Tibet in the era of training in socialist realism painting, to Yogyakarta and Bandun, the sites of the first post-colonial schools in Indonesia, to Lahore, home of the Mayo School of Arts, which became the National College of Arts in the new nation of Pakistan, to the Istanbul Academy of Fine Arts, where the reform of the curriculum coincided with the student movements in, of 1968, and to Hanoi, where the introduction of conceptual and performance-based practices was part and parcel of the Doi Moi movement moment in Vietnam. In revisiting these sites, the Art Schools of Asia program sought to highlight the often under-recognized role played by such places in the teaching and learning to the development of modern and contemporary art across the region and beyond, but also to decentering art history and scholarship. They explored the broader methodological and theoretical implications that thinking about schools and education have for the writings of history of art in institutions more broadly, but also what it means to place Asia at the center of such inquiries. Over the next six sessions, the symposium will provide the opportunity for a larger public to take part in some of these discussions with the participants of the seminars, as well as with a number of esteemed and invited guest scholars. Through the presentations of the participants, we will also be revisiting a number of other sites for, for investigation, such as Sogetsu and Ikebana Flower School in Japan, a number of autonomous organizations in Kathmandu, Nepal, the Art Academy in Hyderabad in what is now India, which you'll be hearing about today, uh, schools and initiatives in Kazakhstan, and self-organized uh, educational sites in Minikambau in Sumatra. In other words, while we at Asia Art Archive like to say that art is knowledge, the work of these scholars suggests to us in countless ways just how knowledge is and could be taught and learned and serve as nodes around which social bonds could form and institutions built. How knowledge does not just exist in the st static state, in other words, but dynamically flows and transforms not just art, but also individuals and society. Before I hand things over to my colleague, Nupur Desai, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, some individuals within our own society, AAA, the contribution of our peers, most especially Susanna Chung, uh, Osge Ersoy and Rebecca Tso in the programs department, Paul Furman, Karen Jung, and uh, Chelsea Ma in editorial, Crystal Lee, Ruby Weatherall, and Haley Wu in development, Sally Lee, Chris Ho, Claire Su, and Jane de Bavois, who understood the importance of the project from the beginning. I would also like to personally express my gratitude to Leah Lam, who as a cohort of the Art Schools of Asia know full well, has been handling the administration for the project and keeping the seminar running as smoothly as it has been, and who is now with Rebecca, invisibly running the symposium. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank the Getty Foundation, and especially Miguel de Baca, Anne Helmreich, and Joan Weinstein, without whose support and vision for the Connecting Art Histories Initiative, this project would not have been possible. And so without further ado, I turn things over to Newport to sign. Thank you, John, uh, for this introduction to the Art Schools of Asia program and the symposium. Uh, hello, everyone. A very warm welcome uh, to all of you for joining us uh, for the first session of the Art Schools of Asia symposium. Uh, I'm Nupur Desai. I'm a researcher at uh, Asia Art Archive in India, and I'm based in New Delhi, uh, where I'm currently speaking to you from. Uh, and as kind of John uh, uh, shared the idea behind Art Schools of Asia, uh, one of the areas that we are kind of interested in and have been researching on uh, at Asia Art Archive is art pedagogy through our research collections uh, as well as through programs. Uh, and through Art Schools of Asia Symposium, we are kind of expanding on those uh, inquiries. Uh, to introduce you to today's uh, panel uh, titled Instruments of Instruction, uh, the panel broadly looks at 
The relation uh, of the art schools to the larger milieus within which they emerged, be it colonial, the post-colonial, or the cosmopolitan. Uh, interestingly, all the speakers who are part of today's session are working primarily on modern art histories of South Asia, and in a way addressing the questions of how we understand uh, the modalities of, of development of modern art histories and art education uh, from the perspective of uh, South Asia. What are the methodological tools and frameworks that one may employ to do so? Uh, and in this context, uh, this session brings together case studies uh, that would inform us about the colonial and post-colonial formations of art education in the region. Uh, through all these uh, case studies, the attempt is to kind of understand art school as a site for social production and what roles do art schools play in larger uh, social and cultural contexts, especially uh, by putting forth the complex relationship of the art schools uh, that challenge, complicate, and move beyond the colonial as well as the national frameworks. Uh, so we will uh, see some of those examples in the presentations uh, today. Uh, the session has two parts to it. Uh, in the first part, uh, we will have uh, members of the cohort, Dipti Mulgund and Santosh Sakinala, sharing their ongoing research with us, followed by a brief uh, Q&A session. Uh, and in the second part, we have the pleasure of having two eminent art historians and scholars working on the modern history of, of South Asia, Professor Raman Shivkumar and Sanjukta Sundaresan. Uh, and the conversation will be for 45 minutes and we'll open the floor for discussion and questions uh, for the next 40 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the uh, Zoom's Q&A feature. And you can do this anytime during the presentations or conversation. And we'll do our best to take them up uh, in the discussion later on. So I'm happy to invite Deepti Mulgund and Santosh Sakinala to present their papers. Uh, and we have been, uh, as part of this nine month long uh, kind of uh, program, we have been talking to each other, sharing our research ideas and discussing them closely uh, over the last nine months. And I'm quite excited to see how these ideas have developed uh, in the last few months. So before we begin, I'll briefly introduce uh, uh, you to them. Uh, Dipti Mulgun holds PhD from School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and she is an art historian with specializing in 19th and early 20th century South Asia. Uh, she is currently serving as a, an assistant professor at the Department of Art and Performing Art uh, at Srinagar University uh, in Delhi. Uh, Dipti has been a postdoctoral fellow at the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence uh, in 2019-2020 and a German Academic Exchange Service doctoral fellow at Humboldt University in Berlin in 2015 and 16. Uh, her earlier research uh, and publications are focused on citizenship uh, and the art museum in the colony, uh, while her doctoral monograph considers the imaginaries of citizenship and equality engendered by art publics in colonial bonding. Her ongoing research, uh, which she is going to share with us today, focuses on a 19th century drawing uh, as taught in public schooling and non-art contexts. Our second speaker today is Santosh Sakinala, uh, who is an assistant professor at Department of History of Art, Kala Bhavan Shanti Niketan, uh, which we are again going to uh, uh, talk about uh, in the latter part of the program. Uh, his research focuses on art institutions and pedagogy, craft in India, history of modern Hyderabad, and the politics of public statutory in India. Uh, Santosh completed his PhD on art institutions in the 20th century Hyderabad. Uh, from the Center of Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. Uh, previously, Santosh has taught at Finance Department at University of Hyderabad and College of Fine Arts at Jawaharlal Architecture and Fine Arts University. Uh, he has also received Arts Research Grant from India Foundation for the Arts, where he explored the space and formation of art pedagogy at Central School of Art in Hyderabad, forged by individual journeys of artists uh, trained at different art schools across India. Uh, so without further ado, I now invite Dipti Mulgun to present her paper, School and Beyond, Drawing Pedagogy in 19th Century Industrial Capitalism and Empire. Uh, over to you, Dipti. Thank you very much, Rupert. I hope my screen's visible. Right. Yes. Great. Okay. So firstly, yes, thank you very much, Rupert, for the introduction and of course to John. And largely, I want to say a big thank you for this extremely well thought out um, this well thought out research program that I've had a, a, a really good time in terms of, you know, gathering together these very complex ideas with regards to art schools in Asia. Um, and of course, we've had a very wonderful cohort. Um, so it's been a very big learning curve for myself, uh, for me. And, uh, you know, I feel like my research has really benefited from that. 
Um, okay, now without further ado, I will take you to today's presentation, wherein I am focusing on the art school in Bombay, or uh, what is now known as Mumbai. Um, and I focus on the period of the, you know, let's say, the roughly between the late uh, 19th to the early 20th century. Um, and what I'm specifically interested in, while we're, of course, we've been talking about the art school and uh, its role in, uh, in, furthering the art, in furthering artistic subjectivity, as well as the, the education of artists and artisans also, um, my interest actually lies in looking at a very specific representational form, such as drawing. And I'm interested in looking at how the art school was, was um, and, and the role of the art school in actually disseminating drawing beyond its portals. So the beyond that I'm referring to here is, of course, uh, you know, into the schools uh, as part of the general educational system in colonial Pompeii, and also the larger movement into, let's say, industry or industrial production, which was the aim with which drawing was actually introduced into, um, into the curriculum in the first place. Um, so let me just get started um, with this. Um, let's let's get a little deeper into this. And so one of the things that I want to start with is, of course, that, you know, schools of art have been looked at as primarily looking at the question of artistic and artisanal practice. And there's, of course, excellent scholarship, which has looked at these questions of tradition and modernity and the negotiations that art schools undertook with regards to this. Um, just to give you one broad idea of a uh, broad sense of the you know, the kind of scholarship that exists, um, but as well as in, in addition, of course, to institutional histories and uh, exciting new scholarship as well. Um, and, but I, I generally find that there is lesser attention that's been given to uh, looking at this broader question of visual literacy or education and quite simply art schools role in, um, within the city, quite simply, or even in a general or within general education. And it's something that sort of gets left out by scholars on education. Uh, and the uh, and, and you know historians of art have tended to look at exactly what you know furthers the question of uh, artistic or artisanal education. Uh, so today, what I'm hoping to do is to actually look at drawing and the school of art that I've um, that that I specifically trace um, by looking at three, let's say, nodes or channels. Um, and and I and I'm trying to keep the focus on three, uh, you know, just for the sake of brevity and also. Uh, to look at largely the human agents and to so looking specifically at what personnel were doing and the kind of approaches that they could have to this question of drawing. Um, I'm, I'm also trying to track or give you a few examples about um, just how there was the adaptation to the curriculum that actually comes from the Department of Science and Art. Um, and lastly, I want to look at, a, um, at, at the role of the School of Art, the JJ School of Art, as an examining body and, an, uh, and something that was, you know, accrediting students with certain degrees, with, you know, certificates and what actually, uh, what might be the balance of such a, of such a, um, of such a move. Um, so I'm just going to, um, and, and of course, so, so this comes from my larger project, which is about, you know, which focuses on drawing in the 19th century and I'm, and I'm drawing upon a number of archival sources. So you'll see that, a, um, that so a number of the things that I'm going to be discussing will be coming from the colonial archive. Um, and these efforts of, with regards to drawing can be located in what Raja Adal has called the global mimetic moment, you know, basically, which is where when children copied what they saw, and nations and polities replicated pedagogical models and approaches emerging in Britain, as he notes. Um, and this global mimesis and drawing was in no small part determined by the constitutive relationship between colonialism and Western capitalism, as, uh, as Timothy Michel has, uh, reminds us. Because drawing in the 19th century was transformed into, um, in, as, as a practice that was seen as superior, seemingly transparent means of translation and transmission, or what would, uh, Rafael Cardoso Denise has called the universal language of industry. So in an industrializing age, drawing could forward the distance between the head and the hand, and the designer and the, work for, uh, and the worker. And my proposal, of course, is to situate drawing in yet another 19th century binary, which is the colony and the metropole, uh, and to sort of complicate that and see how exactly this, this, this gets complicated through these various factors that I've just outlined. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the transcultural nature of drawing is something that has been acknowledged by scholars. Um, so I'm, I'm, of course, adding to that, that set of voices here. So for instance, we've gone through someone like Christine Ho's work, wherein she's looking at wherein she looks at drawing in, in the 1950s, in 1950s China, 
to talk about exactly its its connection to Soviet and European models. And one of but what seems to be a general point of consensus is that drawing acted as a verifiable measure of visual literacy. And this is the development that I want to locate or look at from the 19th century onwards. Um, and now to get, come back to the JJ School of Art, I will just quickly take you through what the School of Art is about. Um, the JJ School of Art can be understood as an archetypal colonial art school, by which I refer to, of course, its location in one of the presidency towns uh, in British India, uh, the port city of Bombay or Mumbai. Um, so that's on the western coast of India. Also to be considered is the fact that its management was in the hands of the colonial government um, and its pedagogical program was governed by the syllabus set out by the Department of Science and Art or the DSA or what is typically known as the South Kensington model. Um, now also typically for colonial Bombay was the fact that one of its city's leading elites, so Jamshed Jujiri Boy, had proposed the establishment of the school in 1853 uh, and provided the initial seed fund as well as land for the school. So Gigi Boy had risen from poverty and, um, and after extensive trading in various commodities, including cotton, opium, and a large shipbuilding business, um, he, was a, he was an extremely well-known philanthropist in the city. And but specifically with the School of Art, what Sir JJ had in mind was the impoverishment of the Indian artist. And so the school was started specifically to address this concern of his. Um, and as you can see that he had in mind a polytechnic institution uh, with various uh, and and uh, and he and he had a sense of what were the kind of things that this this polytechnic institution might impart so as to bring the Indian artisan you know uh, so as to enable the Indian artisan to compete in an age or uh, you know in a situation wherein uh, with regards to you know machine produced goods but also with a with a rapidly changing economic uh, set of economic factors. Um, and so when the school began in 1857, uh, there were 49 enrollments and the program of artisanal reform was tethered to drawing. Uh, or, or to be more exact, it was about accurate drawing. One early report of the school, for instance, noted that the craftsmen were not accurate in their uh, crafts. Um, and that while they were content to lavish hours uh, of work in ornamentation, they were not quite accurate. Um, and so therefore the remedy, as they called it, for this class of faults was drawing, was accurate drawing. And so in some ways, one can think of drawing as, of course, uh, as, as, a, as an effort to create a subject that is well-versed, who is well-versed in streamlined production. Um, and also one needs to remember that, you know, as Michael Adas has pointed out, that accuracy in the 19th century becomes a very valued, uh, or, or becomes a value that is, a, that is associated with Western civilization, a choice value, you know, something that a colonized societies apparently lacked. Um, and so uh, one needs to think of accuracy also along this register. And the reason I start with artisanal, drawing, artisanal reform is also is, of course, because it's so fundamental to the story of the JJ School of Art, but also that it shares with school level drawing a number of, uh, an, an, a number of uh, features. And of course, one being the, the it's, it's simply its curriculum, which was, of course, you know, sort of scaled down for, uh, for teaching at the school level. And, uh, and of course, it, 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 what it carried through was, of course, the similar approach that the DSA, uh, that becomes the hallmark of the DSA uh, or the Department of Science and Art or the South Kensington model, which is that it is, it, is, it is a progressive graduated kind of setup wherein you have to finish the first step to, so as to be able to even attempt the next one. Um, and so, so just to get started with exactly, and then and kind of skipping forward uh, quite a bit, um, but to look at how drawing finally enters uh, Bombay schools. And uh, we have Sir Richard Temple to thank for, uh, he, who makes a very impassioned plea uh, in 1878, uh, writing to the, the Director of Public Instruction. And uh, Sir Temple, of course, has been noted as a kind of art enthusiast. Um, and uh, so he's been noted as an art enthusiast with, and I'm just going to sort of qualify that a little bit. He was very well known also in Calcutta before this, where he starts the gallery of art um, and is generally known for the encouragement of the Indian arts. Um, now, in when, so finally, uh, you know, after his uh, sort of, you know, after he lends way to this entire question, uh, drawing is introduced to Bombay's school curriculum in 1880. And uh, so the way it was done was that students attended classes that were held at various government schools. So there were eight government schools at which these classes were started. 
and they could accredit themselves by passing examinations so this is the grade 1 and the grade 2 after which came the drawing teachers examination now in so this instructional elementary drawing was was open from class 6 onwards that is middle school onwards and what's also important to remember is that students paid an additional fee for these classes so it was not part of the school curriculum in the sense that once you paid the school fees you could simply access it um and what first did uh, art included was freehand drawing model and object drawing and practical geometry while the advanced second grade course included these subjects in addition to linear perspective and blackboard drawing so you had to have the ability to scale it up up to the blackboard level now um now coming to this question of you know that now that we know that drawing had found a place uh, however limited in the curriculum how did the colonial art school go about actually putting this into practice or to put it another way how did grand aims such as creating new kinds of subjects for the industrial age actually how did they come about and i and as i mentioned i want to focus on three nodes or channels or agents to actually look at uh, how drawing was disseminated with the first being of course personnel um and as we and in, and is as is obvious institutions are constituted by personnel in addition to systems and processes and with regards to the jj school of art i wanted to today focus on two so one being of course uh, richard temple who i have just mentioned and um and so john uh, sorry and, and john griffiths yeah who was the principal of the school of art now both of them belonged to the skinny british administration that ruled the massive subcontinent and they were both key in ensuring drawings practice in uh, drawings place in school albeit on very different terms and uh, just to explain so now when sir temple sir richard temple proposed the introduction of drawing he spoke of drawing and i quote as a specially civilizing subject intensifying the powers of observation conducing to accurate apprehension of external matters end of quote a few years later when temple uh, temple spoke of his wish uh, and and he says to teach indians one thing they have never learned namely drawing objects correctly whether figures landscape or architecture now the way to read or what i like to look at from temple's uh, views that he's positing here is of course is a i mean apart from the fact that he's so keen on this great civilizing mission and drawing as a part of the civilizing mission is to understand that drawing had become so important for the british economy that for someone like sir richard temple or a whole generation of people in the 19th century the whole idea of that the importance of drawing is so well ingrained that it becomes something that carries a kind of civilizational heft that it becomes something that is that to know drawing was of course to know how to improve the british economy um um and but and the the, the improvement of native character or the powers of observation as he's noting here um becomes just one more salutary effect now while temple's position as a governor made it impossible to deny his uh, deny the suggestion of bringing drawing into schools it was actually john griffiths who had been championing for drawing's inclusion into the curriculum and so while it is griffiths who actually gives form to temple's uh, you know impassioned plea as he makes um but what was very different about the way that he posited what griffiths was talking about drawing was to was that griffiths posited it as a as an educational minimum right in the annual report of 1887 um 88 uh, griffiths argued uh i quote a knowledge of drawing is just as important to most boys who attend school as that of reading and writing and this fact has been recognized by nearly every state in europe so that the subject has been made compulsory and incorporated in the standards so quite simply he is talking about it being part of the of the you know general educational program rather than a separate optional um but i'm until... sorry to interrupt you dipti but i um, have couple of minutes left okay all right let me i'm almost getting there yeah um until griffiths association ended this plea was not taken up um and and of course so simply to underscore the different terms in which they sought drawings inclusion into the curriculum um and it's only at the turn of the century when the technical skilling of indians took on the form of what the british perceived as a, as a seditious threat that in the form of the politicized child as some scholarship such as sudipa tobdas has told us that drawing becomes a part of the full curriculum instead of a paid option now the second channel that i want to quickly talk about is of course this whole question of how does one adapt curricula and it's a given that all curriculum would be adapted to specific conditions and what i want to specifically tie this one to is this question of uh, the shifting perceptions of failure and success so for instance when in 1884 large numbers of students failed the second first and second grade exams john griffiths interestingly attributed this to a raising of the standard 
through stricter examination really because he noticed that a, a year prior the school had in fact allowed those who were not eligible to take uh, and who were ill prepared to nonetheless attempt the exam griffiths explained that a full set of four specimen drawings had to be submitted before the student could even take the examination so the the course was of course clearly strenuous and its long duration was a significant downside and uh, griffiths was of course sympathetically observing that in such a system even partial success could give the student as he notes here the heart to go on um but of course even in, in given his position the the larger course design of course remains unquestioned uh while working through the dsa based examination system and its graded and progressive assessment griffiths had sought to boost the program success with a temporary measure now over time and indeed right after uh, griffiths tenure the learning and teaching of drawing was more often than not critiqued and blame came to be laid often more often than not at the door of indian students drawing teachers in contrast to the critiques of the south kensington system in england where systemic factors were often targeted and uh, and so of course there were various so one thing was of course to talk about the bad ways or the the lax methods by which indian teachers or you know teachers in indian schools were teaching drawing and then the other thing was of course and so there was a whole range of methods that were you know um, suggested and the other thing being for instance this reconfiguration of the classroom that we can see here um right i hate now, to interrupt again uh, vipti but could you how many minutes uh, yeah i just need one yeah, yeah just like last one minute yeah okay right and so the last pro, the last uh, note that i or, or the last factor that i want to talk about is of course the question of examinations and uh, the school of art in bombay was not only setting examinations for its own programs but also for those of these of the school drawing like i mentioned and um, and so of course for each subject that there would be a different exam uh, there would be a separate exam and as as you can see here um and so while on one hand there was this great the anxiety was that you know that the exam centric system was producing a very mechanical as one report noted kind of drawing um the on the other hand the the recourse was constantly to go back to a different kind of examinations yeah and so this is something that keeps getting replicated so for instance at at one point of time when the drawing teachers examination in 1901 was had absolutely no applicant uh, had no success they still insisted that the standard of drawing must be maintained precisely by upholding the the you know the standard of the examinations because the the standard of the entire drawing uh, of the entire presidency depends upon this uh, on this particular examination so on one hand there was this constant lamenting that the examination system was producing uh, students who had not properly imbibed the fundamentals of drawing yeah whether it was perspective whether it was modeling or any of these other ideas the point being that it was still something that was it, the 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 remedy again was to actually produce different kinds of drawing in 1916 is when the school actually takes full charge so to speak uh, of the of uh, examining drawing and it begins to hand out certificates and diplomas for every stage of drawing now the idea that uh, so on one hand this larger problem of what students were imbibing still remained but in effect or in 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 principle what it could do was that these certificates would actually lead to employment opportunities at least that was the idea with which um these certificates or this this sort of reform in the uh, in the examination system was carried out right um okay so i'm going to stop here um and we can take up further questions in the discussion uh thank you dipti uh, for the wonderful presentation so from uh, drawing training as a site for producing new kinds of subject in the colonial bombay in the 19th century we now move on on to santosh's paper on art institutions and pedagogy in the 20th century hyderabad a state in southern part of india when he looks at the complicated history of formation of the nation in relation to the shifts in art school its pedagogical and ideological configurations i now hand it over to you santosh thank you mukur uh, am i clear audible okay can okay, you see the screen Yes, you can see. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Nupu, and thank you, John and Lee and the entire AA team for organizing this program and very commendable uh, programming and very uh, meticulously planned uh, meetings and all. So very exciting experience in the past ten months. Thank you very much for that. So what I'm going to present uh, within this short time is a fragment of. 
research that I did for my thesis. And I realized by the end of my thesis, by my PhD, that I only happened to also look at a fragment of the area that I was working on. So, so I'll just read through it. Hopefully, I may be able to finish it within 15 minutes. Art institutions and pedagogy in the 20th century Hyderabad. The Central School of Art and Crafts was established in uh, 1940. In 1940, at a crucial point of Hyderabad's cultural modernization and the bureaucratization of its administration. If the Department of Archaeology was established in 1914, had flagged the beginning of the, this process, the central school that was set up 26 years later can be seen termed as representing its maturation. In the 1930s, education emerged as one of the areas with which the government was deeply preoccupied. In one of the first steps in this direction, the government deputed Syed Ali Akbar, the divisional inspector of schools, and Syed Mohammad Hussein Jafri, the deputy director of public instruction to attend the Imperial Education Conference held in London in 1927. Held every year in Britain after World War I from 1919 onwards, these conferences aimed at the systematic reorientation of education in the empire, a shift from, I quote, lesson plans that were filled with imperialist sentiments to the pedagogical developments and educational work, which sometimes reflected a newfound interest in social problems, unquote. While unemployment was a glaring issue in Britain and in parts of Europe and America, after the First World War, the problem equally spilled over to India, especially as modernization transformed and decimated earlier patterns of work. Uh, patterns of work. In the 19th century, British education was rooted in the Victorian ideas of fashioning an individual with a refined personality for an elite society. This concept of education as cultural and intellectual refinement existed in Hyderabad and British as well. In Hyderabad, it, I quote, it consisted of imparting tehzeeb and refining the personality. However, in the 1930s, there were several significant changes in this attitude as the government grappled with the more practical imperatives of job generation. Appeals to provide a practical orientation to education was at this time a countrywide issue. Akbar Hyderi, a bureaucrat who was influential in Hyderabad Hyderabad's administration and who was also an education minister and a prime minister. He remarks that, admittedly, quote, admittedly, as India stands today, her need is for trained agriculturalists rather than government clerks, for trained businessmen rather than clerks, trained engineers, doctors, manufacturers, artists, craftsmen, blacksmiths, weavers, potters, almost anything rather than clerks. The productive work of the country is largely in untrained and therefore relatively inefficient hands, unquote. In an attempt to recognize, in a, sorry, in, a, in an attempt to reorganize and streamline education in Hyderabad state, the Department of Technical and Vocational Education was started in 1936, separating the technical, industrial and vocational education from the general education, which remained under the Department of Public Instruction. The establishment of central school as a result of these ideas was a result of these ideas and these newly identified educational needs. The government of Hyderabad invited A. Abbott, the chief inspector of technical schools under the Board of Education in England, taking advantage of his presence. These are the images of the school where it had begun. about the chief uh, inspector of technical schools under the board of education in England, taking advantage of his presence in India to study the vocational education in the state. He submitted a report to the government in 1938, in which he recommended the establishment of a central school of arts and crafts in the city of Hyderabad. The name that about suggested for the social, for the school may have been directly drawn from the central school of arts and crafts established by the London County Council in 1896 with an objective to help British handicrafts and industries by maintaining their ancient traditions while furthering their modern development and design in workmanship. So this perhaps was a reflection of arts and crafts movement in Britain in, Britain in the late 19th century. While Abbott in his report offered objectives of establishing the central school, he did not provide the curriculum or the pedagogic model. Khan Bahadur Syed Ahmed, 
the founder principal of the central school prepared the syllabus by drawing from the pedagogic systems of art other art schools especially from the jj school of art bombay the jj school also provided this nascent institution with its first principal and pool of teachers so khan bahadur said ahmed was actually a product of jj school of art and now what deepthi presented really forms a ground for me to kind of move forward the background of jj school of art and the examinations that she talked about at the end many of the uh, aspiring students from hyderabad wrote those exams every year intermediate drawing and different sections of drawing so that was there that relationship was there so that also enters into the founding of the central school in terms of the curriculum and providing teachers by the time about wrote his report and the central school was established a growing cultural and artistic significance of ajanta coincided with the heightening of the nationalist movement and until the 1948 ajanta kids were part of hyderabad decade hyderabad uh, state and nizams uh established the nizam's government established the uh, archaeology department to particularly preserve the paintings inside the ajanta caves and then that started a new consciousness about the heritage and the past the cultural past of hyderabad and that also seeps into the establishment of central school so these were the years when uh, the hyderabad intelligentsia's notions of culture were being formed by appropriating the flows of ideas from contesting positions around nationalism and artistic representation in the rest of india dakani nationalism and a dakani synthesis became the cultural coordinates for the expression of a regional identity identity in the mid 20th century hyderabad while hyderabad's identity so when we look at this there are two components that informs this syllabus one is the preservation of the culture preservation of the past and also promotion of the uh, forms of art that that uh, and this is the uh, document where uh, yeah so this is the kind of syllabus we we'll now move into it while hyderabad's identity was fueled by the artistic traditions of the region the culture and history of the place became a source of pride and a resource for aesthetic progress none of these could take on the political will for the state to secure a new destiny for itself and it is in this charged environment of a state caught in a grid of growing but substantially constrained political and cultural aspirations of the dakini region that the central school took its form and this is the syllabus uh, framed by said ahmed who was appointed as after he finished his uh, studies and he was from aurangabad he was teaching and in a school in aurangabad he was appointed as a curator to the ajanta caves after the establishment of the department of archaeology and later he was appointed in the 1940 as the principal of this art school so this kind of gives us a linear story of how the experience of ajanta gets into the curriculum and there are three sections art section craft section and optionals now the art section offered a five year diploma course which was oriented to train the student in skills techniques and sensibilities of visual design and representation in prescribed mediums the different modes of drawing and painting were organized in a gradual ascending order of increasing complexity over the five uh, years this was similar to the pedagogic principles of the department of drawing and painting that just the the just stop at the, the jj school of art where the aim was quote a quote kill career to train the eye and hand of the pupil to understand and represent with firmness and refinement first abstract geometrical shapes and then varied forms of nature unquote these exercises introduced in the mid 19th century at the inception of jj school continue to exist after independence even today Uh, it mm -hmm. continues to discipline the coordination between the eye and hand of the art students and is the basis for training them in visual design and pictorial representation the curriculum also so these are the uh, kind of different exercises i just want you to focus on one thing that you have a blue arrow ancient and ornamental designs so students are uh, made to copy from ajanta paintings and other examples and but particularly ajanta and elora became an overarching presence in all these exercises and there were several uh terms were translated into urdu the terms of art were translated into urdu around 250 and this is 
in 1943, like right after the establishment of the art school. So to give you a brief background, there was a translation bureau established in 1917 when Usmania University was established and several terms were, several texts were translated, but several terms were also coined in Urdu. So new terms were produced, which also happened in the case of art school. So these are some of the images of the environment of the art school. Uh, painting section. There was no painting sculpture architecture that comes later, I will talk about. But this was largely the art section. Um, yeah, so these are some of the achievements you can, you can look at right after like two, three years. The curriculum also included short lectures about the development of fine arts and crafts given by Gulam Yazdani, who was the director of uh, archaeology, and later Jagdish Mithil's joins in 1950. Inherent in the curriculum and the pedagogic exercises in the art section was an emphasis on artistry in the cultivation of artistic taste and intuition. A small evidence of this can be found in these paintings that were displayed in Nagpur in an exhibition uh, in 1944. So how all those exercises from model drawing to you know, different exercises go into uh, making the compositions like these. So these are the kind of paintings that students produced. So another point that I also want to make in this context, in these two paintings is Dakhani miniature was one of the uh, main sources of reference along with Ajanta in, for, for the pedagogic exercises, but also it formed a part of the larger Dakhani consciousness. So we can see how these students in, in the art school were kind of composing paintings based on the ideas, stories, and folklore that continue to be in Hyderabad. Now, the crafts section uh, was to revive and popularize some of the, these are some of the paintings that you see, uh, crafts section to revive and popularize some of the ancient and useful mulki handicrafts by bringing them in harmony with modern taste, assuring maximum amount of utility and securing new spheres of earning, thus to increase the prosperity of the country. And you also can see here very clearly Ajanta, the presence of Ajanta in all the three examples. This is a tray that was gifted to Mohan, uh, Mozamza, who was a prince, who was son of Usman Ali Khan in 1944 uh, at an inauguration of an exhibition. And then the, the other two on the left are produced by the arts and students of the art school also reflect the presence of Ajanta very clearly. Uh, in Nizam's Hyderabad of these years, the term mulki translated, so I said mulki handicrafts was something, uh, there was an emphasis. Mulki translates, translated as native and emerged with the new consciousness that was growing around a Dakhani identity. The language Dakhani Urdu was seen as unique to the culture of Hyderabad, a product of a synthesis born out of the coming together of people of different languages, Telugu, Kannada, Marathi, Urdu, and their cultures. By the time Central School were, was established, craft developed into a powerful conceptual category as a signifier of living tradition and an idealized way of life and had secured for itself a crucial place in the economic and cultural image of the nation. In Hyderabad, this development was reflected in the in the way a regional category addressed as mulki crafts or dakhani crafts emerged in the 1930s and in the way it, this category was determined in the central school. So Said Moyuddin Khadri Zor was the person who, uh, who really conceptualized and uh, formulated the idea of dakhani synthesis and the idea of dakhani nationalism. The, the central school offered three certificate courses in in, in the craft section, which I'm not going into. So briefly, textiles were taught, himru, mashru, which were the Deccani techniques that existed in Deccan. And you have bronze, uh, copper smithy and other stuff. And you have bidri, which again was part of the Deccani crafts. So there were traditional crafts, but also skills of other, other materials were also, also taught. So in the third year, again, copying forms and motifs from Indian miniature, Indian painting and other special designs in uh, saris, preparing saris and other borders were emphasized. I'm sorry to interrupt Santosh, but uh, mm. could you please wrap it up in one minute? When the central school 
underwent several transformations as the political. Okay, I'm skipping Hyderabad Art Society. Uh, right. So this is when uh, okay. when the Central School underwent several transformation as the political political and administrative re regi regimes shifted in the middle of the 20th century. These crafts de departments were renamed as applied arts in the early 1950s, while the art section continued to exist, and the art section becomes painting, sculpture, and later applied arts. So that categories that exist in the post-independence as well. So the Hyderabad Art Society, I'm skipping. With Hyderabad's annexation, dramatic changes were brought by replacing the earlier members of administration and bureaucracy by the bureaucrats appointed by the Indian government. This replacement within the administration affected the institutions in Hyderabad. And also you can see that Central School was also affected. The renaming of Central School takes place uh, from Central School of Art and Crafts to the Government School of Art in 1953. 1956, uh, the new state of Andhra Pradesh was formed. And then again, there is an administrative shift where the new state forms new, new rules of employment. And that makes a problem for the earlier teachers to continue. Some left in between and some continued with some changes. So I will wrap in just, just 40 seconds. Uh, so these are, this is, you can see that there is painting department written, which is, a, which is in 1960s. These are the kind of changes that happen with the uh, appointment of new teachers after the annexation, after Hyderabad merged to India. Sheshagri Rao, who was trained for one year in Champaniketan, who goes back. And this is Sukumar Diaskar on the top. I, I can't see it. Sukumar Diaskar on the top, who also was trained in Champaniketan. So Vidya Bhushan was trained in JJ school. So in the 50s, these new uh, trends enter Hyderabad and it changes. So the kind of, I'm done, just last one sentence, the kind of effort and thought that went into establishing the central school and the kind of pedagogic formulation based on the ideas of Mulki, Dakani, those ideas were disrupted with the annexation. And what was largely happening in, in India was mapped on to uh, the art school in Hyderabad. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Santosh. Yeah. Uh, Amazing presentation. Uh, I have lots of questions for both of you. Uh, and while our participants gather their thoughts and share their comments, I'm just going to go ahead and ask uh, one or two questions. Uh, it's it's very intriguing to see that the colonial backdrop as well as the process of modernization that both of you touched upon, onto which these formations kind of take place, uh, with of course more complex uh, landscape of political context as well as. Uh, local institution configurations in both the cases, JJ School of Art and uh, Central School uh, in Hyderabad. Uh, and so, so we are, are kind of looking at art school as a place where the state forms the subject, the idea of the school uh, and the state functioning in a certain way. And then the premise of kind of institutional framework is, is about kind of co-option and building certain narratives. Uh, whether it's through state or through uh, private public partnerships, uh, which happen in the case of JD School of Art, for example. Uh, I suppose there are also ambiguities uh, as well. And, and my question is, where does kind of change happen or where does intervention take place? So do you see any clues uh, from artist writings or archival materials that kind of gesture towards interpolations or interjections uh, in, ca in cases of both these uh, kind of art school, in case of JJ School of Art in the colonial period, but also in case of uh, Santosh uh, uh, Hyderabad's uh, art school uh, in the later period of time, once after the annexation, for example. So, Dikti, uh, would you like to go first? Yes. Uh, I'm um... Okay, so I'm of course still gathering my thoughts, but if I had to think about it, I would say that, you know, what was interesting to me and which is why I thought it was important to talk about the difference in the position between someone like Griffiths and Temple is because Griffiths has actually been campaigning for drawing to be a part of it 
for much like longer than temple comes in and makes this grand like plea which is you know problematic on multiple levels but um and so this has been so and i think that that has to be attributed to the fact that he's been working with indian artists or that he's been training uh he had been training you know indian artists working also alongside uh them to actually do a very massive project and to go back to the whole reference to adanta that santosh was talking about because uh, griffiths was really part of this uh, was very much you know the center of this project of wherein he you know is leading this um this whole project of having at least 7 to 8 indian students who are copying the murals from ajanta and and you know so something like that and um, and largely from what we see of the archival material is that someone like griffiths was extremely sympathetic to the struggles of indian students at the school and i think that um and or or that he was also constantly for instance campaigning for uh, you know the the introduction of the joint teachers course and you know talking about the fact that you know that these needed to be part of you know uh, or or the joint teacher courses were very much needed because he's also trying to generate employment opportunities for these graduates that he's training in the in, at the school um and i think that that's what needs to be attributed to um, you know and and he's an artist himself i should also mention that because he's he's also coming as an artist very much trained in the south kensington model but where he's trying very much trying very quickly to shift and adapt to the conditions that he finds in india um the other example of course would be someone like havel who also comes in as we know from this revivalist position um and i mean and there's a whole politics that which we don't need to get into but uh what what struck me also is that there is this whole constant negotiation with this large process or this large curriculum uh, uh, you know of the dsa and they are all trying to actually you know sort of work around it whether it's kipling in lahore whether it's whether it's havel or it's someone like griffiths um and they are by and large i mean they tend to be uh, you know coming from similar institutions that they've trained at and they are actually trying to find ways around it but they do i mean that it remains as it is in a lot of ways um and yet at the same time the sort of um interpolation is that they are actually trying to you know get the most out of it for each of these institutions and in terms of what artists or how how they responding is that i mean there's of course figures like someone like let's say durandar uh who will actually take it up and try and like ace the system so to speak right like i mean he's the archetypal figure who goes on to actually make the most of the system in the sense of like being able to respond to it um you know in the, in, in the best sense of its possibilities or you know what it offers so uh i mean so yeah so i think i can that there seems to be an understanding of what the system can or or the different directions that it can go in and but then uh the interest in actually trying to make the most of it uh, or, or trying to you know sort of um gain opportunities for various kinds of possibilities uh, opportunities and possibilities for students thank you thank you dipti uh, santosh would you like to respond yeah. to that in terms of situations that uh, you know situations of rupture uh, i'll give you one example uh, so hyderabad uh, offers a complex case because you know the mulki non mulki thing was there when i when a uh, state was formed in 1956 there was a rule that the the people of uh, andhra region which was not first by hyderabad okay which was part of the british uh, the, uh, presidency uh, madras presidency so the the rule was that because they had a modernization which we didn't have when in 1956 there was a rule formed that uh people of those districts wouldn't be given employment in hyderabad would they wouldn't also be joined and uh, like uh, admitted to the schools or not only art but institutions and one person gets into the art school in 1956 7 going against this so he met chief minister and then there was a way to kind of accept him and that really opened up space to go against that rule the mulki rule okay so that's one instance where situations were there to kind of okay, to kind of you know go against the established norms and rules and another thing which i couldn't really talk about in the context of hyderabad art society was hyderabad art society was established within the premises of the central school as a formal organization 
as an informal organization and which used to conduct annual exhibitions right and hyderabad organization also had these two teachers who were there attached to this school were they were members in this art society they were also like playing major role in that so it offered a network for the students to kind of pass through from art school to the exhibition spaces right so that's where pedagogy was not limited to the curriculum that was set out by the art school but it the space of pedagogy as I, i would say expanded beyond the art school through this formal and informal nexus right and which again expands further in 1962 when andhra pradesh dalit kala academy was established where again you have the same teachers becoming members of it you know so where you have a nexus very clear strong nexus and it had its own problems uh, uh, from in the post independence which so it doesn't follow any kind of a state given state system but it kind of works in its own way formal and informal sort of a, uh, negotiations thank you thank you santosh for that uh we have one question uh, from the audience member nirmala uh, biluka she is asking vipi uh how difficult was it to find uh, these documents that you shared with us uh, and where did you find them uh, so vipi you could like uh so of course uh most of this uh like i mentioned comes from the uh, maharashtra state archives uh which has uh, i mean they tend to have these director of public instruction reports uh there are those and i consulted those uh, extensively there's also something called the examiner's report which are harder to get a uh, hold of and uh, which is why my last slide had mentioned that it's actually uh, professor shukla savant from jnu who's managed to who had taken some copies of these and that's what i um, i could use uh, so the examiner's report also tend to be there but they are harder to come by um so this is largely so there's the director of public instruction there's these examiner's reports and there are the uh, annual reports of the jj school of art so those are also um, um those are also you know uh, available so that 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 is the combination of let's say archival material that i could actually access and it's largely from the maharashtra state archives um not so much the national archives or so but yeah maharashtra state archives would be the one oh uh, yeah thanks thanks to you um we are having an interesting conversation here with santosh and vipi and i have couple of more questions but i'm also conscious of time uh, and as we kind of ponder on uh, the formation of modern subjects and the idea of national and an arts school outside the frame of the nation state or colonial arts school uh, becomes a site for an outside of the arts school uh, to creation of different circuits of dissemination and in that trajectory i think uh, we can pause for a moment and uh, now deliberate on another important arts school uh from this part of the world famously known as shanti niketan uh and we can move on uh, to the next segment uh, of this session uh and we will come back to some of the questions and and comments with uh, with vipti and and santosh at the later part of the, of the discussion uh so established in uh, uh 1919 uh more than 100 years ago uh by nobel prize winner poet and painter and philosopher rabindranath tagore uh the institute um of a fine arts uh, popularly known as as kala bhavan in shanti niketan uh, became a site for uh, articulation of alternative education uh, based on the goes philosophical and pedagogical uh, ideas uh, and as nandalal goes the first principal of the art school and artists such as binod bihari mukherjee and ranking of beach later on expanded on on his ideas through their teaching and their own art practice So Shanti Niketan kind of emerged as a locus for intense interactions uh, between Western art practice, tradition, Indian art and craft forms, and artistic practices from uh, Eastern part of Asia. Uh, and also, the, the institution is kind of situated at the cusp of nationalism and internationalism, uh, where art pedagogical methodologies uh, at Shanti Niketan generated conversations with different cultural spheres uh, across Asia. So, keeping uh, some of these thoughts from a earlier discussion in our mind we now going to move on uh, to this part of the session a conversation uh, between professor raman shiv kumar and sanjukta sundaresan uh, and it's our immense pleasure to have you both with us today uh, most of us are familiar with their seminal contributions to the discipline of uh, art history uh, however for those of who 
uh, who are less familiar uh, with their work, I'll just briefly introduce uh, them here. Uh, Professor Raman Shiv Kumar is a renowned art historian, art critic, and curator based in India. His seminal research uh, has been in the area of early Indian modernism, with special focus on Shantaniketan school, uh, where he developed the idea of context-sensitive modernism, and we'll hear more about it in today's conversation. Uh, Professor Shivkumar has uh, also curated his major exhibitions like Shantaniketan, The Making of Context and Modernism, The Last Harvest, uh, Paintings of, of the Midnight Tagore, uh, and retrospectives of important Indian artists, uh, including uh, Virod Bihari Mukherjee, which was co-curated uh, with uh, Gulam Ahmad Sheikh, uh, and artist uh, K.G. Subramanian. So he served as a curatorial advisor on many uh, large-scale exhibitions, uh, including Rhythms of India, The Art of Mundalal Bose. Uh, and he also co-curated an exhibition uh, titled Trist with Destiny uh, for the Singapore Art Museum to mark 50 years of uh, Indian independence. Um, Sanjukta Sundaresan um, uh, is senior lecturer uh, in history of art in the Department of Arts and Culture uh, at University of Amsterdam. Uh, she's a historian of 20th century aesthetics, researching the interfaces of visual art, uh, left-wing political thought, and historical transition during 20th century decolonization in, in South Asia, and across transnational formation uh, in the global South. Uh, Sanjukta is the author of Partisan Artist Aesthetics, uh, Modern Art and India's Long Decolonization, and is co-editor uh, of Forms of uh, the Left in Postcolonial South Asia Aesthetics Networks and uh, connected histories, which she co-edited with Lotte Ho. Uh, her writings have appeared across multiple peer-reviewed journals, including Third Text, uh, British Art Studies, South Asian Studies, etc. And currently, she is working on her second monograph uh, on transnational conceptualizations of art and uh, liberation across 20th century decolonization, thinking from the locational scales of uh, South Asia. So I now invite uh, Sandrita Sundaresan to start off the conversation, uh, and we'll take uh, questions and comments at the end of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrita. Thank you. Thank you, Nupur. And thank you, Deepti and Santosh, for um, such rich archival papers. And I feel bad that you could not bring in all the material you had, and I hope we will have a chance to return to those. Um, I feel you should be given some more time to sneak in those arguments, but um, very glad to be part of this conversation. And thank you, Nupur, thank you, Asia Art Archive, for also giving me the chance to have this conversation with uh, Professor Shiva Kumar, whose work I have, of course, followed and learned from for many, many years. Um, and um, it's quite fantastic that I, finally get a chance to talk about uh, Shantiniketan, which I worked on in my thesis, but then did not include in my book. So, so I feel there is, I, I feel I need to return to it, but possibly with different questions. And um, this conversation, I hope will, um, you know, uh, give me some of those pointers. So I'm very glad to um, get to ask some questions to Professor Shiva Kumar. So um, I suppose, um, and thank you so much for being in conversation with me, uh, Professor Kumar. I, um, so I, I, I was thinking, and also Nupur raised this, you know, we are standing um, in the early uh, decades of the 21st century with very similar vibes to the 1920s in terms of both questions of art pedagogy quite fundamentally being rethought globally in the context of you know contemporary decolonial conversations um, uh, we are also interestingly you know standing in the midst of an impending third world war that might or might not <laughs> happen and such fundamental questions being asked by artists around questions of environment climate place and questions emerging from place right so 100 years of Kalabhavan, interestingly, has a strange kind of echo in terms of the time in which Kalabhavan was formed, huh? which included a kind of conversation around ruralism, this and that, which we will uh, hopefully get a chance to talk about. I guess to open up, I thought I could ask you that also in terms of the conversations that have been happening in art history in the past 20, 30 years, which have given us categories like post-colonial modernism, you yourself raising the question of contextual modernism way before some of these new vocabularies came up. Also questions of um, vernacular modernism, 
that in the context of Shantiniketan one has heard, but more globally in architecture, it comes up, tropical modernism, this and that. I just feel maybe, how do you look back to the beginning of Kalabhavan in 1919-20 from the vantage point of these questions now? Uh, what, do you, what kind of questions do you think we could take back to the earliest years of Kalabhavan? And, uh, you know, um, what do you think, um, what informed that moment? Um, it's con conception, the moment of conception. Maybe we could begin with that. So thank you very much, uh, Sanjukta. And also, as she said, I, am, I mean, I would have been happy listening to the previous two speakers. Uh, because there were areas which were also new to me in a sense. And uh, so, uh, but however, since we are all slotted in a certain way, uh, I shall begin by, I mean, we'll also start with the slides a little bit. I mean, of course the slides are just there. Uh, it's, uh, as we know that, Kalaban was started in 1919, so it's a little over 100 years. But uh, there is a little prehistory to that. And the prehistory is the kind of ideas that engaged Rabindranath in the previous uh, 15, 20 years. So when Havel and Abhinendranath uh, started on what was called revivalism, but a kind of basically uh, making Indian art a little more and education more indigenous. Uh, in the, I mean, at a juncture that we now call the Swadeshi movement. So Rabindranath, of course, uh, welcomed that move because he did think that we have to uh, know about our past, we should have an awareness of our past. But very both as a writer and an activist who was thinking of bringing about various changes, especially in rural India, he realized that there were limitations to this uh, movement. Especially there were two things that he didn't kind of completely agree with. One was that trying to seek your identity in your past. This was something that uh, he thought was a limitation. Now, because he thought it led the new movement to remain cocooned in a kind of cultural greenhouse and not come into contact with present day realities, engage with the present day realities. Now, you can see this kind of a grievance being uh, raised in personal correspondence, but also in published works like Jinnah Patravali, where he's talking about that when he wants to see changes in the villages, but he doesn't see other artists, other writers coming forward and being part of it. Now, there are also letters that he writes at this moment to his nephews, so that people like Abhinendranath and Gaganendranath do engage with the rural kind of thing. They do in a certain way, sitting back in Calcutta, maybe Abhinendranath's engagement with folk stories, rituals and things like that, but they don't get out and their own practices don't change much. So then he tries to interest younger artists like Nandala, who actually responds a little more positively. And by 1916, when he goes to Japan, and he sees the Japanese art scene, then he thinks he has found a method of what he wants to see done in India, in a sense. So some of the things he saw that the Japanese artists, he thought, responded to uh, nature, which was something that he wanted to landscape and to the elements of nature. In a sense, he wrote a letter from Japan to Abhinendranath, uh, sort of critiquing their work and saying what he needs in their place. So he says that your work is uh, yours in the sense that the, he and his students were doing 
it looked more like a prim garden with tiny flowering plants. But he was saying that I think that India needs a wildness of the woodland with thunderstorms, rain. And so this is one thing it, he says. Now, whether we, Shantinigan, did produce that woodland with towering trees and thunderstorms and all that, but still there was this effort. And that's why I put this little photograph. Uh, it shows Nandalal and the next to him there is Binod Bihari and some of the early other students. And what you see in that little potted plant is a little bonsai plant that Abhinandranath gifted to Nandalal. So what he does with that is to plant it. And today is this big tree in the center. Okay. So in a sense, this is like a metaphor for what happened. So he picks up this small potted plant, then replants it and allows it to grow in a sense. So in some sense, what Kalabon did was this transformation of something that started with Abhinayin Siddharth and turning it into something much larger or trying to put it back and connect it with the earth and mm -hmm. life around. So this is what actually led. Of course, Rabindranath was a constant guiding figure. And without thinking about the thoughts that Rabindranath had about uh, the Indian art scene at that time, we probably will not be able to understand what developed in Shantiniketan. And of course, he was, by the time it was founded, he was already thinking of Vishabharati which okay. is against the background of the world war. And he wants to develop Shantiniketan as a center for East-West, I mean, conversations. Okay. Well, thank you. And I think this image is, um, it is like you say, a, a very apt metaphor to think about also Shantiniketan in the long durée of the 20th century, even now, uh, what kind of, um, uh, what it has done to the larger conversation around art, pedagogy, um, question of aesthetics and post-coloniality, I think. Um, you mentioned Nandalal Bose, so you mentioned Tagore's letter to Abhinandranath from Japan, uh, saying that, you know, you are in a, in a stultifying environment, you need to bring art to the storms and earth and so on. Um, and then Nandalal Bose responds uh, to, to, to some extent, and then he comes. Uh, I recall Abhinandranath Tagore, uh, no, Nandalal writing that Abhinandranath Tagore was initially not very happy because he was coming in from the Indian Society of Oriental Art. And then, of course, Nandalal Bose comes and becomes one of the main uh, huh, uh, art pedagogues. Uh, maybe you could reflect a bit here on, um, and I have found time and again, people writing on um, uh, Bengal, the Indian side of Bengal art, they often mention the use the broader term Bengal school to kind of cover, address any artist coming from Bengal. Huh? Um, and I feel always that there is a need to either differentiate or at least nuance. Um, so I uh, maybe you could um, tell us a bit more about whether you would call this Bengal school as one knows it, I'm thinking, um, you know, uh, Tapati Ghotakuda's uh, extensive work, dense work on the intellectual trajectories of the Bengal school. And also, if it is Bengal school, then what iteration of Bengal school do we see in Shantiniketan? Um, that's one, uh, one question. And also, is Rabindranath Tagore Bengal school? Uh, if can one ask that question? I guess. Yeah, yeah that's what uh, I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. Uh, to me, none of them are Bengal school. I mean, Chantanigan was a kind of double departure. It was a departure from the government uh, art colleges in India at that time. I mean, mm -hmm. the academic training, which this represents a photograph of students in the Calcutta Art College drawing from a model. This was their, uh, the academic kind of method in the art schools at that time. And also from 
that of our brain to now. Uh, so if the, the academic schools, government schools, uh, had this method of drawing from, I mean, objects and post models, Abhinandanath had developed a method of drawing from mental images uh, nurtured by mythological and historical stories. And one, the academic method of the realist kind that demanded a strict confirmation to visual facts. The other encouraged imaginative visualizations, but both of them were equally studio-based and studio-confined practices. Now, Abhinandanath sat in his studio with his students, worked there, uh, get people to narrate maybe and read books and stories and kind of thing, and maybe look at older works of art and then produce new works. Now, this is what changed totally. What, what Nandalal did in a sense, I mean, he came out of this system of Abhinandanath, but he responded much more to Ravindranath's call to get out into the villages, to look at life and connect your work with what you see around. This is what he did as a writer. So he was actually suggesting the same solution to artists. So when he went to the Tagore Estates in East Bengal and where he saw life, and when he tried to respond to that as a writer, it transformed him as a writer very radically. So he was actually suggesting the same solution to these artists. And you can see that this is a picnic and where Nandalal is sitting and drawing. And there is Binod Bihari with also sketchbooks and other things strewn around and looking at what Nandalal is drawing. So this is the kind of work that they did. They got out, he got his students to get out of the studio, to go out and look at drawings. And he wanted to make them draw from nature, not from models. And life, which was actually lived life. Now, of course, he also develops two kinds of drawings, which was interesting because I saw that one of the things that Sandosh was showing was also saying, like copying things, and then there was what he called memory drawing. Mm. What Nandalal did was to go out and draw things. So the first one allowed you to kind of observe. Drawing became a means for gathering knowledge about the world and also to develop empathy with mm. one's surroundings. Okay, And he did what was also called memory drawing or drawing from memory, but not the kind of memory drawing. That's why sometimes these terminologies are not sufficient. Because what probably what was meant by memory drawing in the art schools was one thing. And what Nandala did was to say that you should not only be observing these things, but you should also internalize these things. Mm -hmm. And then you draw the same things that you observed from memory not creating things that were not related, unrelated to what you saw, but doing things which was a redoing from memory. Now, what this did was, one, it allowed this process of internalization and also simplification of things, forms. And the other thing that it had did was it brought about a coordination between visual facts and motor action, the organic, a movement of an artist's hands. So each artist would actually use his body differently, and that would be part of the drawing in a sense. Now, what that does, I just put two images side by side. You can see something that no art school artist would have done at that time looking at an old tree trunk with such interest and making it almost like a character in the whole thing. Not the rest of the things are background, including the human figures. And also look at something so tiny, like a little insect on a stalk of grass. 
Mm. Now, these are things that really brought about a big difference. You can't see something like this in Abhinendranath sketchbooks or in the works of the Bengal school. Now, the other thing he did was to really, he wanted to do something that the Abhinendranath and the Bengal school didn't pay attention to was public art, mural painting, which he was interested to even before he came to Shantaniketan. So when he comes to Shantaniketan, he also realizes to do that and make it a part of pedagogy, you need to study some of those old techniques to know how to do these things. So he brings in craftsmen, traditional, I mean, kind of, uh, painter from Rajasthan. And you can see this traditional painter is there and he's talking or discussing something. And you have Nandalal standing behind him, bending down. And you have Binod Bihari at the left end. And the right, I think, is, I mean, it's not clear. His face is not clear, but it looks like from the body posture, it looks like Ram Kinkar. So you have all these things. This is 1928. So you have all of them now studying or learning from, I mean, craftsmen and other such people. So, and then going into mural painting. This would be one of the mural paintings I look at. So he paints this, and this is a very interesting mural painting, part of a mural painting. And it shows, I mean, scenes. And uh, I don't know if you can see the whole thing. Maybe these, our images are, overlapping it a little bit. Uh, but what you see is it gives you a picture of that Shantanika. All the different kinds of people. I mean, actually, it, there are animals. There's a dog at one end. There is a donkey right at the center. On the other end of the painting, you have a monkey there. And there are these artists working. And then behind you have scholars sitting in the room and reading. Then you have villages sweeping, sitting, and all that kind of thing. So you see a Shantini Kedan, which is kind of having multiple levels of different activities going on. And right in the center, you have, I mean, these artists working on a mural. And you see on the left, the Rajasthani traditional painter working. On the right, you can see Nandalal working. And then you can also see students working. There's an young woman sitting there and painting just about, and others helping them in various ways. So he brought mural painting into the, uh, pro, I mean, annual calendar of Kalabon. And from about 1921 onwards, I mean, almost till he retired, every year there was something happening. So if the first took the artist out of the studio into nature, the second took art out of the studio into public spaces. So these were very important. And in the first three years, I mean, two years, there were three teachers, Ashit Kumar, Halta, Nantalal Bose, and Shudin Kaur, who were the three teachers. Now, of them, Ashit Kumar more or less followed the methods of Abhinita not very closely. But then after a couple of years, he left, and Shudin Kaur became more interested in or engaged in architectural work and the administrative work of the university. So the honors of guiding Nandalal, I mean, our Kalabhavan fell on Nandalal. And I think that gave him a lot of freedom to shape its pedagogy. So he became the central figure in doing this. Of course, he was trying to interpret the ideals which were placed before them by uh, Rabindranath. Okay. And all of them contributed, the next three, in a sense, contributed to this kind of thing. So they did not only these things, but they also sometimes built things like this building, or uh, many, they cut two or three mainly, but many more probably which were destroyed. They did these mud buildings, which were all done by the teachers and students, including Nantalal, Ram Kinkar, and many of the later day artists like, I mean, Shankar Chudri and all that. 
and they worked on it. Here you have, I mean, Ram Kings are working on that, doing a relief on that, along with site students. So that was one of the way they worked. And they also, same time, you can see Binod Bihari doing his famous mural on the ceiling. And which you can see is a wonderful, I mean, kind of documentation of the landscape and life around uh, this place. So you can see this is what they, I mean, you know, the, the, the kind of deviation, the kind of departure from the Bengal school that was happened here. Now, none of these things were concerns of the Bengal school. And I think none of these artists, including Rabin Pramad, can be considered as part of Bengal school. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for clarifying it. I feel um, this 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 nuancing is so important for us to understand both the intellectual trajectory of Shantiniketan and other parts of uh, Bengal, particularly throughout the 20th century. Um, and really the different visual languages um, in the region and also across uh, post uh, across post colonial borders in um, East Bengal, where there is a very different dialogue with the intellectual legacies of Abhinindranath's Bengal school happening via uh, Zainul Abedin, of course. Uh, also, thank you so much for bringing out Rabindranath's own uh, thoughts around writing in relation to the outside, not just the present as opposed to the past, but the present outside and how that, uh, that, that desire is translated in this experimental art pedagogy at Shantiniketan. I think what also comes out in the way you describe the difference of Shantiniketan from the Bengal school, and that's very relevant for the kind of conversation this workshop is having, which is, it is actually art pedagogy that makes Shantiniketan different from the Bengal school. So it's a particular nature of art pedagogy that makes, um, like you said, the, the insect and the tree trunk, the protagonist, uh, really, in the artwork. And also, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering Nandalal's own writing, which um, uh, which is quite a substantial body for even art historians to work with. Uh, he yeah. talks about yeah. time and again contemplation. No? and how the artist then has to uh, enter the landscape in a particular way and both and what you're talking about the memory image uh, are bringing back these points about how Nandalal Bose is also writing extensively on the mechanism of what the artist how artistic work should happen in other words I find that quite um, quite a rich source of people thinking about art pedagogy uh, um, Connected to this, and you talked about the murals, this happens to be one of my most favorite ones. It's just one can get lost in it. Um, this murals uh, kind of bring up time and again, like you noted, the question of Shantiniketan as place uh, and a kind of uh, a place that is both academic, aesthetic, institutional, as well as there is daily habitation of students, of the indigenous community, of animals. So it's a strange kind of human animal, huh? a flora fauna, like, a, like an uh, interwoven text. In this context, I'm think, thinking also if you could reflect a bit on the idea of this intermesh or the intermingling that comes up in Nandala's sense of the decorative. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the sense of the organic. Uh, uh, so if you could reflect a bit on what the decorative has meant in case of, um, in case of Shantiniketan, in terms of the, the craft movement, with Nandalal's idea of uh, Karu Shilpo, basically, and what kind of institutional initiatives within art pedagogy did he uh, explore to kind of bring in that sense of the decorative in curriculum? Uh, uh... Okay, so, well, uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, again, which was a deviation from the uh, uh, kind of pedagogy of Abhinindranath, Abhinindranath uh, didn't think that an artist need a kind of training as such. An artist is born and so he finds his way and so on. So he didn't think there was a kind of process of training an artist. But Nandalal thought that was not the case. And because Nandalal was not only interested in uh, helping people to become artists, but 
uh, if you think about the uh, the kind of uh, experiments that Rabindranath was carrying out in Shantini. Uh, it had two sides. Part of it was, of course, related to uh, education. But the other part was what you might call, I mean, community building. So uh, these two things in Rabindranath's view and in Nandalal's view actually worked, I mean, together. They were uh, complementing each other. And it was this that Rabindranath expected Nandalal and the other artists to participate in and contribute to. So that is where the craft thing comes in. And if you want to have artists who are not merely specialized in a particular area uh, of a thing, uh, being a painter or a sculptor or something else, but an artist as uh, covering a larger area and contributing to it. That was very essential for Nandapal and for Rabindranath. So that all participating in the community building process gave them the scope of moving out of what you call high arts or fine arts or whatever, and also to conceive of an artist and arts itself as a continuum. There is no uh, strict division between arts and crafts but as a continuum. Here again, you can see a difference. The art schools, like what Sandosh was trying to point out, had these craftsmen and they were very competent, no doubt. But there, they, a certain group became artists, a certain group became craftsmen. So they were, I mean, completely different uh, categories and different departments. And uh, even in Calcutta, it was completely two different things. Later, some of those schools became what we call commercial art and so on. But yes. what Nandalal did was seeing art as part of responding to the community's needs made the same person work in all these areas. So he would go on to do kind of thing. I'll skip a few slides because I was thinking and I just wanted to tell something, also bring this thing. There's a little... Uh, etching by Nandalal, and there are these three figures. And I mean, the first trio I said was Nandalal, Ashit Kumar, and uh, uh, Shuren Kaur. And the next group by the uh, mid 20s, late 20s, they are gone, and the new trio is formed. That is Nandalal, Binod Bihari, and Ram Kinkar. And at the bottom of this, uh, you can see it in reverse, it is written NBR. Nandalal Pino Ramkin. And it's written V3. And so there are these three figures under the, I mean, a tree having tea, which was a kind of local small tea shop where they used to go and, I mean, have their discussion. So there is also this kind of constant kind of interaction between these artists. But I'll skip some of these other slides where I did want to show, but also this is an ongoing dialogue between them. Now, this is a painting by Nandalal about uh, 1934. But, and you can see it is this motif that becomes the central motif in Ram Kinkar's sculpture. But actually, it, the painting of Nandalal might have been inspired by a maquette that Ram Kinkar did. And he left in his studio. And when he went to uh, take up a job in Delhi, and Nandalal saw it was cracking up. It was a clay piece. So he preserved it. He got it. He took care of it. He preserved it. And when, I mean, Ram Kinkar returns years later, he transforms it into this sculpture. So in between, you had already this painting, which shows a, a Santal group moving to the local market in Bolpur. It's called the Road to Bolpur. And it also becomes a kind of thing where again, the pedagogy of Nandalal and his interest in the uh, Indian sculpture, etc., gets reflected because Indian sculpture never, I mean, related to our modern Indian sculpture, never related to, I mean, uh, traditional Indian sculpture. Although Indian art, traditional Indian art is very rich in sculpture, except in Shantaniketan and through Ramkinta. So 
you can't see any other because it is always considered even abhinandana thought sculpture will be like academic western sculpture so there was no equivalent to the bengal school in sculpture so you can see that there was this constant dialogue taking place so how they responded to the local rape it's not all one man's job mm. there's all of them getting here so uh, ram i mean nandalal responded to more to nature and people but on a certain scale what we might call naturalistic scale whereas i mean ramkinka responds to the people on a much larger scale he kind of enlarges the monumentalizer and through him the marginal the tribal the peasant enters into that in a way so many things are happening simultaneously and there is a little footnote to it in 44 when there is a kind of i don't know if you can see it uh nandalal draws the sculpture and on the top you have a little plane which is passing through the sky i mean it's the war and i mean so there is a sign of the war i mean reaching uh, shantiniket in that sense and there were also uh, vinod bihari doing this fabulous murals at the turn of at the time of independence so in a sense all these three people did but they did in very different ways and nandala like come back to this in a way that the way they looked at the local was slightly different for each one of them i mean he has this whole thing when he did he didn't do monumental things like uh ram kinkar or vinod bihari but even when he did a large mural like this he broke it up into smaller units so at the center of it you have a little uh thing called the birth of chaitanya which is uh in a sense you can see it is working in different ways i mean it's a mythological figure but it's also something talks about domesticity of the everyday in a sense the birth of a child the celebration of the birth of a child so it brings that world into it and on either side you have symmetrically disposed certain kind of things on this we saw this wall with on to the right of that you see the wall with the i mean daily scenes of shantiniketan and above that you have this long landscape of a rural landscape around shantiniketan okay now on the other side you see a play of rabindranath being enacted so you see a nature everyday activities life of people on the other hand you have a cultural expression and above that you have a different phase or two sides of those landscape of shantiniketan one is this coy the eroded i mean totally barren land the other is the small villages and their life at the two ends he brings together two other images on the dancing girl or the nati of nadi puja on the other side you have a santal girl decorating her thing so you bring a kind of dialogue which is happening within the space of shantiniketan between nature and everyday life between culture of the urban kind of the modern kind which is being produced in shantiniketan in a sense which has its global resonances on the other hand also the culture of the villages its life and so on so if you see the all these little uh pieces that the panels that it does he brings in an assemblage which points towards a much larger picture but he would never allow that image to overpower the viewer in a sense which ramkinkers does so they responded to all these things in each one of them but in slightly different ways so that is what but as you can see nandalal also wanted to go beyond being an artist and do things like this and he was willing to be absolutely anonymous just like rabindranath i mean the readers of this book will never know this the man who wrote it is a great poet who won the nobel prize and they they will never know or care to know if who is this artist So but true. both yeah so both of them were willing to go to this and embrace this anonymity which mm. was something in a sense so you can see where they come together where they differ is also i mean 
true, but they all were responding to the place and they responded in, I think very quickly, I will show you a few more images. I mean, just to show sometimes the lead went from one man to the other. And sometimes when you say this, we also think about separating them too much as mm -hmm. if they were all totally, into, I mean, they didn't, I mean, re respond to each other. That's not true. This is Binod Bihari. He was the first artist who decided not to do any historical mythological painting. There's not a single one by him, okay? Right from his student days. So he does this, he adopts this scroll format and does this huge scrolls of local landscape, which again is going away from the idea of landscape as a uh, little bit of tiny bit of selected framed uh, beauty for corner of the world, but it, interacting with the space as a whole. And then you can see Nandalal actually follows him in certain sense. I mean, the lead there goes to be not be happy. And all, when he does all these kinds of things, Binod Bihari again, and you can see that Ramkinka, although stylistically might not be the same, but he's basically responding to the surroundings in the similar manner. And even between Ramkinka and Nandalal, we see this dialogue. This is Ramkinka and this is Nandalal. Mm. And again, this is Nandalal in 41. This is Ram Kinkar in 48. So, I mean, we try to put them all in different things. One is modern, one is kind of thing, but there is a dialogue constantly. And the place they live in and responding to that is the foundation for that dialogue. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. It's so helpful to see these uh, side by side, uh, to think about that dialogue and also connected to that sense of dialogue is that broader sense of art pedagogy and the genealogy of that art pedagogy. Huh? So something that develops via dialogue in the 20s, 30s, 40s uh, with Nandalal, uh, both Binod Bihari and Ram Kinkar, and particularly what happens to that dialogue after Nandalal Bose retires, uh, also around the time of post-colonial transition in India is perhaps maybe the, maybe the last point I'm also looking at time, we could really uh, dwell on and maybe use that as a pivot to the last uh, part of this conversation, which is okay. um, this, there is a sense of the social that develops in different ways, the dialogue between the social and the formal. And I'm wondering when Nandalal, when Ramki Inkarbej and Binod Bihari and others become uh, uh, pedagogues themselves, how do you think this dialogue shifts? And also in terms of the art pedagogues coming from Shantaniketan working in Shantaniketan in the post-colonial period, what do you see the post-colonial trajectory of these questions um, in Shantaniketan? Okay, I mean, See, the whole thing is that Shantini uh, in the after the independence, probably I think it doesn't carry forward uh, a lot of these things, but uh, the people who are trained there take them out. I mean, hmm. uh, maybe I just wanted to be, I'm not going to look at the craft part very much. So let me... uh, There's just much one has to select. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one has to select, so I just leave that. And you can see there were things that were happening. I, as I said that uh, post 41, there was a shift even in Nandalal's attitude because in 1941, after Rabindranath dies, uh, Nandalal, and he's also, he's also saying that he will be retiring very soon. So he becomes a little more conservative because he's bothered about the preservation of not only Kalabon and Vishabharati, the independence of the place as Rabindranath had visualized it. And he brings in certain changes in the, uh, in the, the structure of, the, of Kalabon. Until then, actually every student would choose the teacher under whom he or she worked. Mm. The, it was highly student-centric in a sense. But in the mid forties, around 45, 46, Nantalal introduces this method where each student will work with each of the teachers in turn. 
uh, for a certain period of time, and they would have these circles. Right? Now, he was actually preparing for certain things, a transition, uh, so that the teachers would not feel left out, students would not congregate to one person and kind of thing. So he wanted to kind of, in a sense, the, the absolute freedom that existed before that is slightly curtailed. Yeah. And that is because Rabindranath guaranteed certain things, which he thought was no more guaranteed under the new regime. And it was soon, I mean, as we know that by 56, it becomes a central university, the UGC norms yeah. and other things take over. So in a sense, his fear had some groundings. And as we saw before, his closest associates, Vinod Bihari and Ram Kinka, who agreed with him in many aspects, they were also much more individualistic than him. I mean, so the collective kind of uh, work which Nandalal promoted in a sense, he was not sure whether that will be going ahead. He recognized the great talent of both these people. He has said that these are complete artists. I mean, he has said this in more than once. So he recognized their talent and greatness as artists, but he also thought whether they would be institution builders. Actually, they were also not keen on doing that kind of job, both of them, in a, for different reasons. So that was one thing. So in a sense, really the baton is taken over by other people who were students in the 40s and 50s. Yeah. So it is like somebody like Subramanian who carries it forward. And then they bring about, I mean, a change in the art scene in other parts of India. So uh, basically, you can see that many of the things that Nantala did, Subramanian carries forward. His yes. whole interest in murals, and also murals done in such a way that it is not as dominating, it's not as self, I mean, asserting as the works of, I mean, uh, either Ram Kinkar or Binod Bihari. So it, he does this, he's willing to, uh, I mean, kind of work with multiple mediums, get groups of people to work together, collaborate with craftsmen. So many of these things that uh, Nandalal kind of develops that pedagogical thrust is taken uh, forward by him. And he is willing to do books for children. I mean, that same kind of ethics and toys uh, kind of learn from traditional crafts and kind of innovate on the basis of those crafts and work of craftsmen and also engage with the popular all this becomes important. Maybe another artist from the 60s who was trained here. Also, you can see somebody like Ram Chandra and Desens, who is doing this huge mural size paintings and who works at that scale, but also is illustrating for Manthu. I mean, yeah. uh, his stories, he's willing to kind of do books for children. And part of his whole idea was to, through these illustrated books, he's trying to introduce children to the folk traditions and their languages. So he's using the book in a pedagogic manner, in a sense, or even make stamps and so on and so forth. So you see there is a kind of uh, afterlife of this. You can think of Ray who kind of makes his films, who always said that it is his training in Shantiniketan that allowed him to, taught him to look at nature, to look at life closely. So you have Ray who kind of, especially in his early films, mapped this transition of India. And you have others who also contributes, designers and various others who comes into that. And they are sometimes in a sense contributing to the nation building like, I mean, Sudramanian, but standing outside the framework of the nation state. Because in those early years, there was space for that. You could, yes. Uh, there was space allowed by the nation state itself for people who wanted to 
kind of contribute to it without being completely part of it. Yeah. So there were so the that and really goes on to these people. Thank you so much. I think th this point about the afterlives is quite evocative. I'm also looking at the time. Maybe Nupur, um, we could pivot to the concluding part of the conversation if that's okay. Do yeah, you, sure, sure. Yes. Where we were uh, anyway, hoping to. I think we've already raised these points about uh, um, uh, KG Subramanian or Ramachandran carrying on this this afterlife of art pedagogy at Shantaniketan and we were talking about genealogy. I really think it's this afterlife of the line really, Nandalal Bose's line and linearity that comes up in the works of these artists. You, you mentioned uh, Ray where again one of the striking things uh, seeing Ray's just it book illustrations growing up was the strength of the line and it's much later I realized where that line comes from, you know, the rigor of that line comes from. Um, you also raised this, um, I'm glad you brought out this tension around um, art pedagogy between uh, Nandalal Bose, Binod Bihari and Ram Kinkar in the in early 40s uh, and how this tension really is tied to who sees himself in this case as an institution builder and the artist. So this dialogue between the institute, the artist as institution builder and the artist as the, you know, the, the maverick or, or that's also a part I see in uh, East Pakistan, East Bengal around Zainul Abedin and his generations of students mm -hmm. who feel that he's not going far enough. Uh, and and, and I, I recognize that anxiety in Ram Kinkar or Binod Bihari writing in the 40s around Ram, Nandalal Bose, where he's both supportive and feels that tension. Um, but there is around Shantiniketan this broader, you know, despite these dissonances and this dialogue, the wider location of Shantiniketan. And because in this gathering, we are seeing art schools from different parts of the subcontinent, but also globally. Um, just to open up the conversation, I think, and uh, then I'll stop, is how do you see Shantiniketan's international of course, we are talking about location, the present, the outside, and then, of course, the national scale that some of the people carrying that genealogy uh, take. But how do you see the transnational genealogies of Shantiniketan, both at its moment of arrival that we began with, but also uh, in the later 20th century, or maybe now, even in terms of methodology uh, around art pedagogy that uh, our scholars here could think via, maybe? Yeah, okay. I um, mean, well, one of the things is that this year 1919 is a very interesting date because there were three art schools that starts about the same time. Besides Shantiniketan, there's Bauhaus yes. and there is this Russian, uh, short lived Russian experiment, Lukultamas, I mean, which is, I mean, uh, is a kind of um, uh, uh, art school which lived only from about 1920. It was formulated, it came into existence after the revolution to address the needs of a modern Russia. And it ended by 1930. In 1934, in a sense, the most vital uh, uh, moment in, I mean, uh, uh, in kind of Bauhaus history also comes to an end. So you have uh, Shantini Giden, which also then in a sense forms part of that moment and of very optimistic kind of intervention in art education. So that is one of the moments. And of course, there were very different things. I mean, both Bauhaus and Vukutimas were meant for responding to an industrializing nation or the aspirations of an industrialized nation Definitely. and for mechanical production. But Shantiniketan realized in the colonial system that it was not meant for doing that. And it has to depend on the, the hand crafts production that we had. And in fact, even people like uh, Subramanian carry that forward because even after independence, while Nehru in India wanted to go towards that modern industrial nation that he imagined, there was a lot of these people who did 
crafts and who lived by crafts and how to carry them forward was a question even then. So uh, the crafts in Shantanayan was always handcrafted, hand produced using local talent amongst the people, including peasants who were trained for that. But the other two institutions moved towards industrial mass production. At least, so there were these major differences, but it becomes, comes into existence at a point where art pedagogy is being, I mean, reconsidered in a big way and it contributes to that. So I think it's an important, uh, one of the three important art schools of that moment. On the other hand, what happens is that there was already this pan-Asianism, which had, was, I mean, in the process before Shantanagaran started from 1902 to end of 1902 onwards with Okakura's visit, which started with Japanese artists coming and kind of thing. But that was a very imperfect encounter in a sense, because they had a particular idea why they came to India. They came to India to look for their Buddhist roots and Indian artists were looking at them for a new visual language. Mm. So they were looking across each other. It is a very interesting, I mean, kind of encounter in that sense. And, but I mean, it helped people like Nandalal and Vinod Bihari a great deal and even made an impact on somebody like Rampinka, who normally we don't associate with the Eastern traditions. It also opened up Nandalal's perspective on things. I mean, uh, which went far beyond Abhinitanal because he thought about, when he thought about Asia, he thought about everything from Persia to Java, everything was there. So his whole idea of Asia was far, far larger than that of Abhinitanal. So all these were things that came, but there was also a, another flow. At a certain point in history, it was also the space that people in the East looked towards. So there were artists, maybe in small numbers, coming from, I mean, uh, Burma or Myanmar, I mean, from Indonesia, from Thailand, and some of them who made their name later in their countries or contributed to the growth of modern practices in their countries. So that was there, and this comes a little later, which is interesting because uh, some of them did come early in the 20s and 30s, but a number of them come to Shantanika in the 50s, because immediately after independence, there was for a moment the look east policy yeah, yeah. of kind of thing, and that allowed those scholarships, allowed some of these artists to come. But these were also not artists just like India at that moment, we're not simply thinking about making an Asian collective as an answer to the Western kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The East-West dialogue was changing. So when these people came here, part of it was that this was a station in their journey westwards. So some of them did come to Shantanikas and stay here for a short time and then move to Europe. But there too, sometimes some of these dialogues went on. So for instance, Afendi, I mean, uh, but when he goes to Europe, whom does he meet? Krishna Reddy, mm -hmm. I mean, who was also a student here and who then also makes the same westward thing and becomes part of the innovations in modern art in the West yeah. as a printmaker, exploring, <coughs> I mean, kind of, simultaneous kind of thing. So there are these histories which have not been completely and some sometimes tragic, like the Indonesian artist uh, who came here, uh, I think Haripato is name, he came and because of the world war, he got caught in it and he was imprisoned in the Red Fort for I think almost two years kind oh. of thing. But of course, he goes and he joins the art college and he becomes one of the major figures there and so on later. So you have all these stories, all these kinds of things which have not been explored uh, at all in a sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are just beginning to do that. So I think it did continue in a sense 
till the 50s. And of course, it did make some impact on the art education scene in India through its students when they went to teach in other places, whether it's Subramanian and Shango Chaudhary in Baroda, or whether it's Ram Chandran in Jamia Media, and so on and so forth. So thank you so much. I think these nuances and the granularity probably could also be our chance to uh, return to the art schools and uh, that need to go to the granularity of the material, the archive. Uh, so the question, I think one of the questions that was raised early on in the Q&A was, where did you find the material? I, put, I, I absolutely identify with that question. Where do you find the material? You know, to let the material speak. So maybe we could um, uh, give the floor uh, back to maybe, uh, maybe Professor Shiva Kumar would like to respond to their papers. And uh, yeah, if it's, it's back no, no, to you. I, no, I think if there are other questions, of course, I mean, I'm quite interested in what they said, especially in the case of drawing pedagogy, because one of the things I'm interested in is how is drawing used? I mm. mean, because, when we say, like we said, okay, we talked about uh, memory drawing, but how is it used? What do you mean by drawing? Why mm. it's kind of, a, for instance, of Nantalal, it was not just a technical skill, but it was a tool for engaging with the world. It's a tool for building empathy, which is not something that you mean when you say accurate drawing. I mean, accurate drawing doesn't have these concepts behind it. So, I mean, you, uh, what I'm interested in is, and also because it's an ongoing thing, because uh, we were talking about how drawing or art might be introduced into schools, and I think we are still talking about it. I mean, in a sense, we still don't have a strong art program in our schools. And what should be kind of thing? This was also some of the things that uh, Nandalal and some of the others did think about here. I mean, although it was largely an art college, but there was also school attached to the uh, Shushantini and So that was also something that was thought about in a certain sense. So they thought in terms of sense training, in a sense. So some of these can be, I mean, interesting things. So this whole thing about drawing is, and how it is taught and why it needs to be taught. Of course, there are practical reasons. So I can understand why you talk about accurate drawing. Uh, in a certain way. But also what is behind that, that is quite interesting. So in a sense, maybe all these things uh, related to drawing in India across these uh, schools, across these periods would be interesting to kind of think. So that is one of the things. So uh, I thought that uh, what Deepthi brought, I have heard her before, as you said, but uh, I find that part of it quite fascinating. And also, like I said, I mean, uh, when Sardosh was saying, I talked that what is in this syllabus, what, I mean, when you put things to words, there's also something that we need to look behind these words, what is actually being implied. So uh, like, Copying is much easier to understand, but when you say what is memory drawing kind of a thing. So, I mean, these are fascinating things. And I think that they have a lot to explore. And um, uh, both of them, I have been uh, familiar with their works a little bit, but I think that they have a lot of things there to explore and I'm sure they are going to do that. Um, yeah, maybe Deepthi, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Shiv Kumar. Um, so I'm very grateful for that comment. And I should also, uh, I mean, you know, just to go back to, I'm going to grab Sanjukta's little suggestion that we can, you know, go right back to the material we didn't bring in. But uh, just as a little, uh, you know, add on to that. The, the thing was also that, you know, in a later stage, what I found also interesting is that there is the citation of um, child-centered pedagogy, right, wherein the child uses, and what you mentioned also, a sense training. Um, and I think these ideas are kind of floating about for a while by that time. Um, and wherein, you know, there is this conversation that, you know, children build knowledge of, of the world through their senses, um, 
and drawing as part of the Frobelian method or the kindergarten method um, and also the object lesson. So these become these, uh, you know, the channels through which uh, drawing also, you know, is part of this, this larger understanding of how children are actually making sense of the world. But what was interesting was that the methods keep coming back to this DSA model. And that is what I thought was this great mm. paradox, because on one hand, even when you talk about creativity of the mm. child and, you know, sort of trying to talk about the consciousness of the child, I mean, I mean <coughs> the childhood itself being a kind of romantic construct that comes up from the late 18th century onwards mm. as a distinct stage within human life. But, but that the methods keep going back to, uh, it, it, you know, so there's the citation of this child-centered pedagogy and then there is the methods remain rooted to this, you know, very uh, strictly graduated progressive kind of method. Like you can't jump to, you know, level five unless you've not completed all of this. So to me, that was also interesting that it serves as a great, uh, you know, sort of horizon to which they are uh, supposedly directing drawing and children's creativity towards except that the methods will remain the same. So, uh, but, yeah. but thank you so much for your comments. I, I'm really hoping to take that forward uh, as, uh, you know, looking across schools. Yeah, one of the things, I mean, which might first, I mean, which we didn't talk about very much. One big difference in the, the approach that Nandalal developed was that you didn't start with skills at all. So uh, what each student started with was his or her own work or what you sometimes call creative work. And then uh, the teacher just came in at that point to make one aware of what other things you might need to learn to take this forward. So it was always uh, a kind of, I mean, a learning of skills led by one's own creative needs rather than if you look at the other academic methods was you start with the skills and you graduated, including uh, in fact with Bauhaus and with Chikamas, this was the kind of thing. You thought that first year you do this, you then you get through that, then you get the stage. So the stage-wise progression, but he kind of completely reversed it in a sense. You start with your work and then you become aware of what you need to learn. And then the teacher helps you to learn those things. So each one probably will need to learn a different thing, not the same thing, kind of thing. So that is when we say student-centric, that freedom and that should be allowed in a way. And that's what is kind of thing. What you said is absolutely right. Even people who are uh, call themselves very avant-garde, forward-looking, when they come to... Uh, art education, the schools, I think they falter because they think that what we need to know is given this package of knowledge that we have now, I mean, all the theoretical frameworks, all that should be handed over. But the point is that this theoretical framework may not stand after 10 years, five years. So what it needs is the ability to explore things themselves that is what we need to hand over to the students or make them capable of rather than really handing over a toolkit which is very up to date i mean that's not the kind of thing so i think what you said is very interesting or you carry on with the old kind of drawing classes i mean copying from books copy books etc so you have these two ends which you can see i mean in existence in india today so discourse on this would be very important for at least trying to change those things. Very quickly. Uh, yeah, uh, Santosh, yeah. Santosh. if you have any quick response. Uh, in terms of copying and draw drawing was compulsory in mm -hmm. central school and everyone like from craft section and art section, everybody, everyone had to do drawings and memories and copying was one thing that was very much emphasized and in my observation what they were copying was the surface and the surface effect like when they were looking at ajanta or any other examples of art from the ancient uh, you know, art they were trying to kind of imitate the surface and the visual effect as they were also trying to capture the form and which also goes uh, it, it's also the same with the copying of Ajanta paintings that you know was started from the mid 19th century. They were trying to grapple with the effect. 
that enters this art school in her yeah. So just that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. Uh, Sanjukta, do you have any responses to both uh, Dipti well, and there Santosh? Are... Uh, we have a few minutes. Yeah, so okay. if, if no, you have... I can just very, very quickly. Um, I, I will first speak as a historian. I understand that, you know, the, the, the charms of the colonial archive is such, it provides us a, a stable place to go to, even if it is fragmented, right? So, um, because I work with the other side, the lack of the colonial archive, particularly in the field of art discourse, which is what I do. And this is, uh, to begin with, it's to Deepthi. Thank you so much. This point about the drawing really opens up so many things and also Professor Kumar's comments. Around the same period of the material that you are looking at, could you go to the periodical literature of the period and see if there is a discourse on drawing? Um, and particularly this point about accuracy and employment, these are all such strong analytical, they have such strong analytical possibilities and artists who do not want to do technical drawing, who want to take the discourse of technical drawing further, you talked about Durandar, what were they talking about? And that is what I really miss in the colonial archive, there is this immense silence. And yeah, they might not talk about things in a consistent way, which is what I found in my work. It's very frustrating, but at least one needs to grapple with that frustration, their frustration and our own in studying. So I think that would be great if you mix that, that'll be quite a perfect combination with the focus on drawing, which I think is so needed to focus on a particular art form and push it, push it. That's one thing. Um, in Santosh's, again, it is just so great that both of you are talking about this very specific, either institutions or genres. In Santosh's, um, if I can read my own handwriting, what was the translation bureau? We talk so much about vocabularies of the South, this and that. When it comes to, you know, the rubber hitting the road, uh, people often do not then come up with the quote unquote, the vernacular keeps evading them, right? So your translation bureau could be that immense place where you can really, so you talk about ideas being coined, huh? so invented and translated. If you're writing on this, I would love you to have a chapter on this. What was being invented and what was being translated? And it is so important to have that vocabulary in Urdu already because you could then see what the National Art College in Lahore uh, were, were they coining new things in the 1950s? Uh, because they had similar, and what's it? It's uh, Nadim Umar Tarar has worked on it, but also more richer work on uh, that. The other was the idea of the Dakshini. Uh, you talked about Mulki and Dakshini and that construction and how that, if I'm if I'm correct, how that transforms when Hyderabad state is uh, is assimilated, annexed, whatever we call it. I would say annexed, but there we are. But uh, that, that transition and this idea of the Dakshin would be another place to develop because I'm very interested in quote unquote locational, huh? even quote unquote vernacular formations. That Dakshin is interesting, that painting Savan, I think, you know, it is citing not only your, the other works, not only to Dakshini miniature style, but also Savan was had like Ravi Varma right on it. That will be the quickest place to go to. Now, without fetishizing Ravi Varma, the citation has a Dakshini mechanism to it that, you know, you're bringing in the Dakshin. So that would be an interesting thing to pursue. And also Mulki, I assume, comes from Mulk. So I think that space of Mulk could also be. So I'm just saying that maybe at times working with the colonial archive or institutional archive, maybe we could step back and forth to really have these conceptual formations, uh, whether that is, uh, you know, uh, the vernacular vocabulary or ideas, even if that vernacular fails or gets assimilated into the new hegemonic, which is the, 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 the Nehruvian nation state with all its merits. Um, that will be the two points. I, I learned more than I have to say, but yeah, I, I just thought I would say these points, but maybe others have, or you could respond or whatever. Yeah, Dikti and Santosh, if you have like quick responses to Mr. Sanjukta's feedback. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Uh -huh. So the translation bureau was very much attached to the Usmania University, where like texts, books of books on science, maths, and other 
streams were translated by the translation bureau and certain coins were also turned you know, mm. in the process uh, this comes very late 1940 and early 40s by then translation bureau was uh, almost disbanded right mm. but i think the practice continued because you had individuals who were consulted yeah. and then that continued so and as i said <laughs> at the beginning that when i touched up on this material and it took so much time but i only could produce this much now i realize there is a lot more to kind of explore in terms of these zones that which i will be, i will be doing and that's that's about translation bureau and this fact is also something that i found very late the the coinage of the terms you know uh, so i need to really again look at look at it how what what are those terms if i find and archives are very difficult uh, we don't oh, find yeah. archive archive and particularly like after 48 the archive stops in hyderabad at uh, 47 actually 46 47 so that thank you i will i will be looking at it and then mulki yes that was a kind of cultural nationalism mm. framework of cultural nationalism without being nationalist in the nationalist sense right a kind of a consciousness that was there celebrating a kind of a multilingual social fabric you have marathas uh, people speaking marathi kannada telugu english was there but also urdu was there mm. so it was a fabric which again there was this uh, posing of urdu dakhani dakhani urdu as against the north indian dakhan uh, sorry north indian urdu right so they were grappling with this idea of dakhani identity in relation to culture but being part of india there was never a, an instance that i came across that they wanted to differentiate from what is called indian nation of india as an image but there was a clear consciousness that differentiates dakhani culture language and ways of thinking and being from the rest this is the sense that i got which is not as i said not the nationalist so deshi nationalism that we have in the british india right so they were sharing working with those ideas but also kind of you know uh, from their own location as you said the, the specific location so the contesting ideas of let us say uh, nationalism from uh, from what we see in calcutta that was emerging and the kind of nationalism that jj school in the early 20s 1920s they were trying to contest right they were contesting kind of nationalist positions they were aware of you know, we see that hyderabad was aware of this you know, people in hyderabad was aware of these different positions but they were kind of constitute a sort of a, an expression of uh, expression that is rooted in the space and its culture its its multiple languages and the composite culture that, that was celebrated yeah yeah thank you that's very rich if um, i yeah just a quickly response and jipta thank you so much and your point about the seductions of the colonial archive are very very well taken and i couldn't agree more with you um and uh, you know i have to say that i did a uh, you know in precisely this effort to sort of dislodge this perspective that comes from the you know so the sort of you know the many gifts that the colonial archive keeps throwing up and even as it keeps hiding a number of things that you do need um actually so uh, what I, i you know this was it's a, it's it's a bit of an aside in the sense that it was actually an effort that i took with regards to my larger doctoral project which was looking at art publics so with regards I, to reception right so if you want to look at reception you of course have to look at you'd want to look at sources that are precisely outside of this you know the official archive to look at this dispersed and what was interesting to me is that a number of the um a number of uh, discourses that come up uh you know whether it's regarding what is the nature of art what is the the questions of censorship uh what is appropriate art for a nation you know these kind of questions let's say for the marathi language press uh which is what i uh, looked at um was was something that came in a little later at the uh, you know towards the latter part of the period that i was looking at so i was let's say so 1850 to 1930s if that was the period that i was interested in it's actually starting off at the point that where i stop my inquiry so to speak now okay. of course so i just wanted to uh, say that you know but at, before that the the conversation seems to be more around theater which i thought yeah. was interesting or fairs for that matter and i thought that was a fairs and you know 
the parallels they're drawing between exhibitions and the kind of agricultural fairs that are coming up. And, you know, to me, those were all also very fascinating things. But, you know, that's another conversation for another day. But uh, so, yes, so I completely agree with you that, you know, with regards to drawing, that's a, it's an exercise worth doing. The little things that I've come across is that there is a general consensus with regards to also, let's say, Indian teachers. Like, for instance, I found uh, as part of one of these, you know, educational periodicals, one, mm. uh, you know, one Bengali teacher is, is really just saying that, you know, it, uh, drawing is not just a part of, uh, is not just any uh, exam passing subject, but is part of his discipline. So, you know, like very, very enthusiastically taking it up. Um, and so, I, I, and that's something I do remark upon in the, you know, in the, in the larger paper, which is to say that, there is this point of consensus. So there's this great distinction that takes place about like, you know, you know, the traditional, uh, you know, whether we preserve traditional crafts or on the other hand, there's the modernizers, you know, this is the usual two broad, very broad categories that we know of. But then there's, you know, with regards to drawing, there seems to be a fair degree of consensus. The only dissonant, let's say, practices that I have found, apart from, let's say, what Professor Shiv Kumar was just sort of talking about, would be something like the Jaipur school, wherein they are, they, they actually start with saying, we will not do joy. Mm. Um, and, but then uh, later, of course, they also bring it, uh, bring it into their curriculum. But, you know, so these are the, you know, so to step away from it, I completely understand. And I would love to, you know, uh, push that uh, inquiry, that line of inquiry a little more. So thank you for that comment and the reminder to step away from the seductions of the colonial archive. No, but you have worked on the larger art public. So I think it's already there, maybe not just in this presentation. But thank you very much, both of you. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dipti. We have one question uh, for Santosh uh, from the audience. And this question is from Vasvi. Uh, so before wrapping up, I think we'll take this last question. Uh, in one of your slides about art curriculum under the section optical, optional subjects, uh, there were separate courses mentioned for boys and girls. This sets a contrast with the other slide with the note uh, men mentioning achievements by students highlighting girls' achievement. Would you have any comments about ways in which gender roles played out in imagining the subject of art education in Hyderabad? I actually typed her and I answered it. But anyway, so there was no, I mean, there was no separation as such, but there were few extra optional subjects for the uh, girl students, like embroidery and needlework so lace making it was also very meticulously sort of structured like different kinds of embroidery and different kinds of lace making perhaps to kind of attract also women like girl students or to facilitate you know uh, a skill that is feasible or easy to them but uh, it was not the case that they will be stopped or they were stopped from taking something like uh, color technology there was something called color technology in, in, in taught in there or something like photography. It was not the case. They were allowed, but if they were, they want to take optional subjects was optional. Like they were, were supposed to take two optional subjects. So that's it. There was no uh, stopping them. In fact, Thank their you. works were also sorry. Just one last. No, no, please continue. Their works were also displayed like the works of the boy boys uh, boys and. Also, there was a provision of displaying their works within the art school and there was a provision to sell them. So some of the works were also sold because like a museum art school and money would go to the students. So that also happened. In fact, I, I heard someone sharing that one of her paintings, still life paintings were sold and money got celebration and all that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. Uh, I'm mindful of time uh, and uh, I think we can wrap up for the day. Uh, these, these deliberations have opened up multiple directions, I think, for us to, to think through. Uh, and like, like two areas that I can think about, uh, which we discuss at the end, one is the students, uh, art students. And I think throughout our sessions, we have been thinking about, uh, about art students and, and what does it look like to be a student in an art school or, or uh, how does it kind of, how, how has it changed over the years or what kind of uh, social uh, and cultural backgrounds and elements that students brought into the school. Uh, uh, that is one area. And the other area is about the aspect of linguistic uh, spheres, I think, and what uh, what is produced through these overlapping linguistic spheres uh, in the regional model. And, and 
in 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 cases of all these articles that we have kind of uh, looked at today. So and and I think it's it's been a great journey uh, with Deepthi and Santosh. So thank you so much, and I hope that uh, we will continue our conversations uh, uh, in the future. And I'm immensely thankful to Sanjukta and Shivkumar sir uh, for for being here with us today on for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, it, it was very enriching and affecting uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, so, so thank you so much for critically engaging with the pedagogical frameworks uh, and its implications in, in the larger context of South Asia. Uh, as we have also mentioned in the beginning, uh, this symposium will be on till June 10th, and our next session is uh, in the symposium is uh, scheduled for tomorrow, Wednesday, June 1st, uh, at the same time, that is 8 p.m. Hong Kong time. Uh, and this session will focus on schools uh, between society and state uh, with members of the cohort and invited guest interlocutor Amanda Rath, uh, an expert on modern and contemporary Southeast Asian art. So please stay tuned and do join us tomorrow. Uh, before I sign off, uh, a big thank you to our technical support team for this program today, Osge, Rebecca and Leah, uh, who are behind the Zoom backend. And a big thank you to the research team at A for their inputs and support in the program. And finally, thank you all of you for joining us today. Uh, well, thank goodbye. You. Thank you very much to okay. everybody. And uh, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, delight.